But notice how this area of my balls, my balls, that sounded so weird. <laughs> Всем привет! My name is Elvin. Happy New Year! I hope you had a great celebration and you already set up your New Year's resolutions. If you didn't, no worries, you still have time for that. Me personally, I decided to start up this year on a high note creativity-wise by creating this New Year's post for my Instagram. Super proud of how this turned out since this is the first photo that I made from a surreal idea that I had in my mind. And the most challenging part of this all was lighting and coloring. And it was not possible without the power of Lightroom, which is what we're going to be talking today. You see, my original approach to making this photo was to have no lights in my living room, just in the corridor, so that it will illuminate my face and therefore we can pull off this effect as if this other world, or the picture actually, right, illuminates my face and therefore everything kind of sticks together in one composition. Unfortunately, I quickly realized that is not possible because my aperture does not open wide enough. So I'm losing a lot of detail, everything is just too dark. So I don't have any lights and the only solution I had was to risk it and to use the main ceiling lamp in my living room, which is not the best for photography whatsoever. And then I used my bedroom lamp. I placed it on a chair in front of me so that I have enough brightness in my face to separate me from the general exposure. And then I loaded up to Lightroom. I started basically changing and twisting every single knob that I could find to see exactly what each one of them does. And after around 30 minutes, I finally got to this nighttime look, which I was very, very surprised that I was able to make, even though I had little hopes of this one. I mean, I thought that this project is a dead end. So I thought, you know what, I am going to sit down and I'm going to actually learn Lightroom, see what each parameter does and learn what they do, so that then I can shorten my editing, improve my editing and also develop my own style, which let's be honest, takes a lot of time. So let's see how Lightroom works. All right, so we are in Lightroom. I'm going to try to make this tutorial as simple, fast and informative as possible. So when you first open Lightroom, you are greeted with the library window. This is where all your previously imported photos are stored and you can preview them and then start editing. If you already edited a photo and you close Lightroom, when you open it back, usually it goes back to the last photo that you've been editing, which is very convenient from the productivity standpoint. Now in my case, I don't have any photos, so let us actually import some. There's two principal ways to do this. You can either go to File, Import Photos or Video, or you can just press the import button on the bottom. Now there's also a third way, which seems like no one really wants to talk about. So it's gonna be a secret between the two of us, which is you can simply drag and drop photos from your folder. So when you choose any one of the option, in this case, let's press the import button, there will be an import window where all you need to do is basically define the folder where to take out the photos. The cool thing is that if you just take one photo and drag it to Lightroom directly, it will open up the import window and show you all the photos within that folder. So it actually knows where it comes from, but only one is selected. So in this case, all I need to do is just select the other two. You can just change what you want to do with the photos on the top. I usually just keep it at add and then press import on the bottom right corner. So press import, it'll load and it'll show up in your library. Now, before we go to our editing, it is important for us to actually go through the photos and to see which ones we want to edit. And this is super handy when you have a lot of photos. So you can preview every single photo by just taking any one of them and just double clicking on it. And if you want to go back to that same grid view, just press the grid view button on the bottom over here. So press on it and you are here. And then you want to go back, you can either double click or press the one beside it, which is the loop view. Now here, when we have our three photos, we want to see which one is the best. In my case, I think I am going to choose, it's going to be the middle one. However, if you have 10, 20, 50 photos, how do you know exactly the one that you liked? And this is where flags and stars come in hand. What I can do is I can press the flag button or it's a P on the keyboard and it will put a little flag on this photo. This way I know that this is the one that I liked. 
Now if we have a lot of photos and we are not sure which ones are the best one and we want to do let's say a sort of a elimination process what we can do is we can let's say take these three photos and I will say okay so these two I like and I'm gonna put two stars on each one of them and then in the filters section on our right side I can just select all the photos that have a rating and then when you have rating you can just select which type of rating you want more than one more than two more than four so on and so forth so in this case we're gonna take two and it just shows us two photos that I rated as two and then between those two I can then decide which one I want and in this case it's gonna be this one so now let's get right into the editing for this we need to go to our editing window which is the develop press on it and now the interface changes a little bit now on our left side we have our navigator pane which is similar to the library and this is super handy when you want to quickly move between your picture when you're zoomed in so for instance i zoom in and you can see the area that is zoomed in and that you're previewing in on the navigator so instead of moving with your hands which is quite slower you can just quickly adjust it within the navigator super handy below it we have the presence which also i think is where the lots are you have your snapshots history super handy when you want to go back to something that you did not like as an edit and then you have their collections and on our right side is where all the magic happens on the top we have our histogram this is basically a visual representation of where all your colors are within the white and the black spectrum so on our right side and actually if you hover your mouse on the corner you will see it says blacks whereas on the other side highlighted is the whites in between we have our shadows which is this mid black area we have our exposure which is the general brightness of our picture and we have our highlights which is the mid whites now the triangles that you can see on each side of the histogram are clipping highlights but what it does is that it highlights any area of white or black that is clipping and clipping is where you have just pure white or pure black information within a specific area and there is no other detail within it for example if i choose the white clipping and i increase my exposure all the way up you see it highlights everything that is clipping and if i turn it off that we cannot no longer understand what is within this area where is the door where is the corridor nothing and the same goes for the black so let's revert it back to how it was and below it you have just uh, some technical information about your photo now below it you have these six icons now out of them all the first one is the only one that i consider to be the one you're going to be using in the beginning of your edit and this is the crop tool so when you press on it it allows you to either crop your photo or align it so your aspect ratio will be the crop and in, right now it's in free form however if you want to lock it like this just press the lock and now it'll be locked to this aspect ratio or you can change the angle of it and alignment by just changing this one now in my case i'm gonna just leave it like it is let's close it next we have the other five which i consider to be the final steps of your edits in a sense that they just add more flavor to your photos and are more local adjustments rather than something more global so we use them more as finishing touches the first one is the spot removal what this one does is helps us to remove any elements of our photo that we don't really like for instance let's say that we want to get rid of this light switch from this wall what i can do is i can just paint it over release and lightroom will pick an area in your image which it thinks suits best to cover that area up and it this one is the one that we need to cover and this is the place that it copies it over it's like a stamp tool basically now if you want to preview we can just press escape it deselects and then we can see if this works and actually it's done a pretty good job and if you want to adjust it just select it again and just move this one around and just for the sake of explanation let me just move this over to my 
the sweater and you can see that it just copies everything that it sees within that area that I drew. You see? There you go. If you want to delete this one, super simple, just select it, press backspace and it's gone. Next, we have our red eye correction tool. Basically, it fixes all the red eyes in your photo. You basically need to just draw it within your eye and then uh, it's going to do its magic or you can just change some parameters as well. Next, we have the graduated tool, which I really call gradient tool. All it does is adds a bit of gradient to our photo. And the cool part about this one is that it also gives us a bunch of different parameters that we can play around to add more style to our photos. So for instance, as an example, let's press anywhere and just drag it like this. And as you can see, it's brightening this area up in a gradual way because our exposure is at one. So let's just change this to dark and you can better see what it's doing. You have this gradual change between the dark and the bright parts. And you can adjust this by just moving this outer lines. And the harsher or the more feathered it is. And then you can move it around by just moving the middle one, just like this. Now you can add additional ones, just draw more like this. And each one of them is separated with this little dot that you can just press and then adjust. If you wanna delete it, super simple. Again, you just select it and then backspace. So you can just do like this. Next one up is the radial filter. This one allows us to isolate specific parts of our image so that we can just do very local adjustments. So for instance, if I wanna change the color of my hat, I can just draw a little circle around my hat. And as you can see, it actually does the opposite. It brightens everything outside, which is the default way of how this thing works. And it's because the exposure is also at one. So if we change this back to normal and we press invert on the bottom, it will apply the effect only on the hat. Now let's change the temperature. And now I have a blue hat. Simple as that. Let's delete this one. And next we have the brush. The brush is like the graduated and also the radial filter, but it gives us more flexibility because we can now draw. We can, for instance, just color in this table and then apply an effect just to that area. And this is super handy when you want to color, let's say, something like around my legs. So you can really zoom in, change the size of the brush and just get right into those detail, which will be a nightmare if you want to use just radial filters. And once again, select it and backspace. And let's just close this one. Next, we have our basic step. This is the second thing that you're going to start working after your crop or for example, the first one, if you're not gonna use crop at all, and this is your basic adjustments. You start with the treatment. This gives you an option of whether to adjust the photo with color or without. But if you wanna go black and white, just press on it and all the colors are gone. Super handy and quick when you want to make monochrome photos. And then you can also adjust different settings for this black and white photo. For us, we're gonna go into color, Next, we have profiles. By default, it's add up color, but each one of them has different effects for your liking. Honestly, I just keep it at add up color and then just do all the adjustments myself. Next, we have our white balance. Once again, we have some predefined settings which you can select in the as shot and just choose auto or you can choose daylight. We can go back to S shot. We have our selector tool, which you just press, and then you just need to choose any neutral color, whether it is white or gray, and then it's gonna adjust the overall white balance. Now, sometimes the selector tool will not give you the desired result. So this is why we have the temp and the tint parameters that we can just play around and change the parameters, just like this. If you want to reset it back to zero, just double click on the word itself and it goes back to where it was originally. Now, in our case, we want to pull off a night look. So I'm going to start with actually reducing the temperature way lower to around maybe this area for now. Just because we want to have a more blue tone within the full photo. Next, we have our tones. 
We begin with our auto button right here that does everything for you if you desire to. In our case, we are gonna go and do everything manually. First, we have exposure, and this one is the global adjustment of your brightness. So if we increase it, our photo becomes brighter, and if we decrease it, the photo is gonna be darker. In my case, I'm gonna actually darken it because we're gonna have this night look. I think this is enough. And as you can see, it's really cool because now we can see more detail within these brighter areas. Really, really nice. Then we have contrast. And this is basically the difference between the bright and the dark parts of your image. The more contrast we have, the whiter the whites become and the darker the blacks become. And then if you reduce it, the more flat they become. So they basically turn into this gray area, which is the balance between the two. Now, contrast is a setting in Lightroom that can be changed in multiple ways. This is one of them and the most global one. And then we are going to be going through the other ones as well. For now, I'm not going to be touching contrast because I prefer to have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to adjusting my darker and lighter tones. And that is where our next section comes in, which is highlights, shadows, whites, blacks. Highlights is known as our mid whites or as simply the brightest parts of your image. By increasing it, you're going to be increasing the brightness. So as you can see, this area right here becomes brighter or we can decrease it. And by decreasing, we will also reveal more detail within that area. Now, this is too dark. So for me, I am going to actually leave it like this, maybe reduce it just a little bit just to have a prominent line separation between the door and the corridor. Next, we have our shadows. Shadows is the opposite. So it's the mid blacks or the darker parts of your image. So increasing it will brighten the dark parts and decreasing will darken it. In my case, I am going to increase my shadows a little bit just so that I can see more detail within my sweater. Then we go to our whites and our blacks. Whites is basically the global adjustment of the brightness or the white areas because every pixel has a bit of white and black information. So by increasing our whites, we will basically increase the brightness of our photo. And as you can see, if I crank it up too much, then we start clipping. Now in my case, I think I'm gonna just increase a little bit just to add just like this is good. And I will decrease my blacks as well, just to give it a more richer look. And if you have noticed, when you're adjusting contrast, you're actually increasing saturation of all your colors because they become less flat. So for me right now, this looks pretty good. Yeah, for now, let's keep it like this. Next, we have our presence. I will be honest, took me a while to understand but basically presence enhances detail within your photo. And one setting that is missing from this section is the sharpening, which I think should be there as well, because texture, clarity, and dehaze are variations of sharpening. They all stem from that. So sharpening in a nutshell is basically increasing contrast of every single pixel within your photo. And if sharpening is on a pixel level, texture is the next one in line where it focuses more on the finer details within your photo. So if I increase my texture, just notice how my sweater changed and also the creases became more prominent. And also you can see more detail within these balls. So let me go back to zero you can see how it changes. And if I go the other way, then these areas became more blurry, specifically these areas right here. Next, we have clarity. Now this one affects bigger detail within your photo. So if I increase it, notice how it starts changing the walls, the floor, the table, and then only my sweater. And if I go the opposite way, it starts blurring everything and notice how there is more detail actually within my sweater, my hat, and also the balls on the table compared to what the texture was doing 
which was reducing the detail or blurring more the balls and the sweater rather than everything around it. And finally we have dehaze, which is meant to reduce haze within your photo if you have it. And if you don't have it, it basically affects the highest contrasty areas within your photo. So for instance, in this case, the highly contrasted areas are the walls. So if I increase my haze, it darkens the walls. And then it does the opposite when you reduce it and it basically whitens everything out. So all of them have their own uses, definitely has to be used in moderation. Originally, I did not use this one when I was editing my photo. However, now understanding what it does, I think I would crank up a little bit the texture just to make my sweater pop a little bit, just to have a bit more detail there. But it's not really a big deal. Next, we have our vibrance and saturation. I'm gonna start with saturation because this is a global effect. And if I increase it, it increases the saturation or juiciness of every single color. Whereas if we go the negative way, it reduces all the colors all to monochrome. Vibrance on the other hand does something completely different. It increases or decreases the saturation of the least saturated colors within your photo. So in this case, for instance, if I increase my vibrance, my walls become bluer and also my sweater has full of color. However, notice this candle right here. If I reduce our vibrance back to zero, the candle pretty much stays the same. That is because compared to everything that we have here, the candle has the most saturation and contrast. And also this greens have the similar effect if I increase it again. You see the greens pretty much stay the same. And if I reduce it to negative 100, you can see that pretty much everything is monochrome, but I can still understand what colors are on my sweater, the reds and the greens, compared to saturation, which is completely monochrome and we don't know what colors we have on a sweater. All right, now that we have the basics, next is the tone curve. This one, to be honest, is a beast of its own and does deserve a lot of attention and I think a video on its own because I heard this is a very powerful tool to adjust not only your contrast, but also to manipulate color. Now, basically the way it works is that on your bottom part, you have your darks, on the top part, you have your bright areas. And then in between you have your regions. So this one is your shadows this one is your darks your lights and your highlights and you basically change this line and based on what you change it will then affect the colors within your image now i don't really like this type of line and these parameters they just they're not so user friendly for me to be honest what i'm more used to is to have points that I can specifically press and change. So for that, I need to press this button right here, which is the point curve. The parameters go away and now you can actually place points on your photo like this. And then you can just add and change these areas. So for instance, I can just slowly add a little bit more contrast in the shadows and my brightness are, is okay. Maybe just a little bit right here. And the interesting part of this one is that just a small change already does a lot. So this one is very, very sensitive. And then if you want to also change the different RGB settings, you can also just go to your reds and then you can just change your reds and make it red or, or more blue or something like this, for instance. And then you can just right click, delete the points. So you can also change the different color spectrum within the curves, which is why it is a big setting. I am yet to master this area right here. After your tone curve, we have our HSL slash color. This is the fun part. This is where you're gonna be playing around with your colors. HSL is hue, saturation, and luminance. And then finally we have all. If you press on each one of them, it gives you your separate parameters or you can press all which will give you all three of them. Hue represents basically the colors themselves and you can then shift the colors between whatever you want. So for instance your reds will shift either to your purples 
and you can see this one on my sweater right here, or they're gonna go more towards the oranges. Or a more prominent example of this one is the blues, so because we have a lot of blues, I can either push it more towards purple, or I can move it more towards this aqua color, which by the way is really, really cool. So I think I'm gonna keep it something like this. The saturation represents how much of the color is gonna be in the photo. So for instance, if I feel like there's a little bit too much blue here, I can just take the blue parameter and I can just slowly reduce it to the desired, or I can increase it, it really depends. And then we have the luminance, which represents the brightness or darkness of those colors. So for instance, if I feel like the blues are a little bit too bright, I can just then reduce the color, just adding a little bit more contrasty. And as you can see, it only changes the blue parts, which is very handy because I can completely isolate just those areas compared to using the tone and the basic adjustments. Now, an interesting tool that each section has is this little button on the top left corner. When you press on it, what it allows you to do is to adjust each section by just clicking and dragging an area on your photo. Just like this. And I'm just moving my mouse up and down. Now, it really depends on you if you like it or not. For me personally, I prefer the sliders because I don't depend on the sensitivity of my mouse that much. And I feel that I can be more precise if I use the sliders. However, it really is up to you. However, a very, very handy element of this tool, which I use, is whenever you hover over a specific part of your image, it actually highlights the color on the sliders. If I'm not sure what kind of color it is, I can just easily just use this tool to determine what slider I can use. Super, super handy. And then you have this color, which gives you just this global adjustments of your colors. I don't really see the use of it if we have our HSL. Then the second way we can manipulate color within our image is the split toning. I'll be honest with you guys, until now I didn't really understand how to use this one and I've always avoided, and I think a lot of people avoid this one as well. What it does is that it changes the color of your highlights and your shadows. So it's like an overlay of color on each one of them separately. So we can choose the color of our highlights by using this hue and then adjust the saturation right here. We can do the same thing by pressing on the box and we can either change the saturation with this parameter right here or by just selecting the color on our, on our palette right here. So if I press all the way up here, you can see that the saturation is also on maximum. And the result of this is that our picture becomes green, and especially in these highlighted areas. But so far, we don't see any difference between the shadows because we didn't choose a color. So let's go to our shadows, do the same thing. Let's, let's say take red. And as I add red, the more saturation, now you can see that everything around the darkest part of our image becomes red compared to the highlights, which are green. And then you can balance between the two how much of the color you want to add. So if I move it more to the plus area, we're gonna add more highlights. And if we go to the negative, we're gonna add more shadows. So this one really is something that I still need to really play around and understand, but you definitely go ahead, try it out and see if you like it. For now, I'm gonna Turn this one off. And the final way we can play around with color is this calibration tab on the bottom. This one from my understanding is different profiles from different cameras and you can basically adjust the tint of your shadows and you can also change the hue, the global hue of your reds, greens and blue channels. So for instance, if I take my blues, I can change anything that is related to blue either to kind of this purple color or to the aqua. This by far is one of the easiest ways you can pull off this teal and orange look. In my case, I don't really need it. I might just increase a little bit the teal look, although just a tad bit, just for the fun of it. There we go. 
Next on our list is the detail. Detail is our sharpening that we spoke about in the basics. So the way it works is that we have this little preview pane which we can actually select by using this little icon here. If it's just white and you cannot see anything. So let's, for instance, choose something that is really visible. Oh, let's take my face, for instance. And you can see here the basically the little pixels of this photo. And based on this, you can then adjust your sharpening and decide and see real time what it does. So for instance, if I increase the amount, the pixels become more contrasty, which you don't really notice on the main photo, but you can see it right here. And then you can change, of course, the detail of it, which adds even more contrast to it and also the radius. And actually, when you already establish your sharpening, you can then also define where the sharpening will be applied. And you can do this one by holding the Alt and then moving your masking. And as you can see, your picture becomes really weird. And the way it works is that everything that is white is where the sharpening will be applied and everything black will be ignored. So let's say I want to just use my sweater and some, some finer details. And now the effect is applied only on those little parts. Next, we have noise reduction. And in a sense, this one is the opposite of sharpening. If we have any noise that is caused by lack of lighting, or perhaps you're editing the colors too much and they start breaking down, you can use noise reduction to basically blur them out. And therefore, it's going to become smooth. So for instance, if I change my luminance all the way up to 100, you can see that my face becomes this silky smooth texture. Really strange and unnatural. But then you can also play around with detail. So if I crank up the detail all the way up, you can have a little bit more texture in my skin. And also you can play around with the tech contrast, color, detail and smoothness, all that help you to battle the noise within your photo. Now you need to use both noise and sharpening in moderation and in combination between themselves because they're basically fighting each other. So there's no point in you over sharpening your photo and then also using noise reduction because in the end they'll just cancel themselves out. And also your photo will just look really weird if you overuse one or the other. Even like this, you can see that my photo becomes a bit extra smooth in a lot of places. So definitely not something I wanna do. And in my case, I'm going to actually turn this one off because I don't really have any noise that I need to really tackle. Maybe I can just sharpen a little bit the detail, but overall, I would say that it's not really a big problem within my photo right now. Next we have is our lens correction. This tab helps us to fight the distortions that are caused by our lens. We can remove chromatic aberration, which is when our red, blue and green channels do not meet at a single point. So you can actually see like all of these three colors. So it can help us. In my case, if I press on it, it doesn't do much because there's no chromatic aberration. Or you can press this enable profile corrections, which will then make an adjustment based on your camera and your lens. So if you can see in my case, it already knows that I use a Canon and an EFS 18 to 55 millimeter lens. So we did a correction. And as you can see, I had some vignetting on the edges of my screen, which was fixed and also a little bit of distortion. Honestly, I prefer to have it off because it gives me a better look. However, it really depends on you, to be honest. And then you have these parameters on the bottom, which gives you a little bit more fine tuning. But then you can also go to your manual and this is where you can just adjust it yourself both the distortion, the, the fringing, so this is for the color aberration and the hues, and also the vignetting, so you can add or subtract vignetting. And it's important to note that actually, as you can see, it only affects the corners of your photo. It's important, why? Because if you want to add vignetting, what you can do is you can go to the effects tab where you have a better post cropping vignetting option and this will apply a vignette in a circular fashion, the one that we all know. And this one we can then play around with the roundness of it, the feather and so on and so forth to your liking. And here also we can add the grain for more vintage look if you feel like it. 
And finally, we have our transform tab. This is where we can just change our photo. So for example, we can just move it around, distort it in different ways. Really handy when you have some sort of distortion that is not fixed by the lens correction and then you can just come here and then fine tune it much better to your liking. Now to finish off this photo, first what I'm gonna do quickly is to go to my effects. I wanna add a bit more vignetting just to center our attention towards the doorway. So maybe just like this. And I'll add a little bit of feather just to, just like this. But I'm not done yet because I wanna add a little bit more darker areas on the sides here so that we can really pull off this look as if the room is illuminated just from the doorway and the vignetting does not really help here. So what we can do is we can go to our graduated filter and I'm gonna just reduce the exposure to let's say minus one just for the, for the sake of seeing what it does. And I'm gonna just do like this. I'm gonna just add a line, maybe just move it around like this. And add one from the other side as well, but a little bit smaller. And I think from the bottom also works. Actually, I'm gonna low, small, make it smaller, but reduce it just to add just a little bit extra pop in here. And this is pretty much it how I made this photo. I then ran it through Photoshop to add all the elements and then moved to DaVinci Resolve to add the fireworks. And in DaVinci Resolve, I added a final purple tint to the overall image just to make the background, which had this purple sunset vibe, to stick better with the rest of the composition. And that is basically it. The final thing here that is missing is just to export it. And you can do this one by just going to file, then go export. It's gonna give you this window right here. In the export tool, you choose where you wanna export it. So let's say we say desktop. You're gonna then define if you have any subfolder within that folder. Usually if you select the folder itself, you just don't need to do anything here. And then if you want to, you can rename the photo with whatever you want, or you can just keep it as whatever it is and it's gonna save it as a JPEG photo for you. You hit export and voila, you are done. And this pretty much sums up this tutorial. I think this is enough for us to upload a couple of pictures, start editing away and exploring our creativity. Of course, there are other areas in Lightroom that deserve their own research and attention. Just tonal curves on its own does, I think, require a video on its own. I'll make sure I'll make one as well. I think it's going to be beneficial because I heard that this one tool on its own is super, super powerful and handy. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Do drop a like, consider subscribing, and I see you in the next one. Bye.